Ekabo, Nono, Sanu Dezua, Akwaba, Bonjou. It's not likely that I've covered all the languages of everyone present in this auditorium today, but I hope I have definitely covered some of them. My name is Abiola Adekoya. I am a Wimbis associate, and I'll be anchoring today's event. On behalf of women in management, business, and public service, I welcome everyone here and those joining us virtually from around the world to the 2017 and 12th Wimby's Annual Lecture. We do appreciate your presence and participation at today's event. Before we commence, may I ask that we all kindly rise to sing the national anthem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please be seated. As we proceed with today's event, we'd like to encourage you to kindly join the conversation on all the social media platforms using the hashtag Wimbiz Annual Lecture. We are also streaming this event live for the very first time. Thank you very much. So may I ask that if you're joining us virtually, Please leave us a comment so we can know which country you're tuning in from. Thank you. Our vision at Wimbiz is to be the catalyst at, that elevates the status and influence of women and their contributions to nation building. This year's lecture is designed to challenge women to push the envelope and chart new territories. This is in line with our objectives to empower women to achieve their potential and become meaningful contributors to the economic development. As the lecture is being delivered on the eve of the International Women's Day, which is tomorrow, the lecture will align with this year's theme, Be Bold for Change. As a result, our 2017 annual lecture topic is Bold Steps in the Face of Uncertainty. To tell you more about today's topic, Please join me in welcoming on stage the chairperson of the Executive Council of Wimbiz, Mrs. Aisha Ahmad. Please can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you very much, Biola. Our keynote speaker, moderator, Special guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's not very loud. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the Executive Council, and the Associates at Women in Management, Business, and Public Service, WIMBIS, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Annual Lecture. At WIMBIS, we inspire, we empower, we connect. And over the last 15 years, I'm proud to say we've engaged over 80,000 women across our various platforms and programs. To learn more about us, visit our website, wimbis.org. I always take the opportunity, because it doesn't come often, to celebrate the Board of Trustees for their vision in setting up the Wimbis platform. Applause. Thank you very much. 
And I'd like to especially acknowledge the new chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mrs. Fumi Roberts, who is here with us. So the annual lecture was launched in 2004. We want to examine topical issues that usually come out of our flagship annual conference, which holds in November, and also trending global issues. We always hold it in March, Women's History Month, and this year, as Biola has already said, on the eve of International Women's Day, which is a time to reflect on and celebrate women's achievements. So the 2017 theme, Be Bold for Change, is really a challenge. And I love the challenge this year because it's both for men and women to take action that truly drives change for women across a number of areas. Celebrating female achievement, challenging bias and inequality everywhere we see it, and advocating for the protection of women's rights. I'm glad to see a number of men in the room and I know they will take this charge. Likewise, the difficult and uncertain economic terrain of the last few years in Nigeria, even in the face of remarkable local opportunities, it calls for a similar audacity as we look forward to a recovery this year. For us, both narratives make the theme for today's annual lecture very relevant. Again, the theme is bold steps in the face of uncertainty. I think you would agree that we need some new insights. We need some inspiration and a healthy dose of realism to ensure that we emerge stronger through this economic recovery. This is what today's lecture is all about. And I'm very, very proud of the speaker that we have today. She's the producer of groundbreaking wedding party movie. Have you seen it? <laughs> Which has achieved significant box office success. And that is a noteworthy accomplishment in itself. However, her career journey has navigated several roles, sectors, and opportunities across Africa. And it started long before the glitz and the glam of entertainment world. She's a bold risk taker, my words, who constantly reinvents herself in the face of changing realities, and she has achieved great success in the process. Thus, I'm honored to now read to you the formal citation of our keynote speaker, Mo Abudu. Mo Abudu has achieved success in various fields. First, as an executive in ExxonMobil for nearly a decade, as the promoter behind the Protea Hotel Oakwood Park, and as the founder of Vic Lawrence & Associates, one of Nigeria's leading outsourcing firms. She entered the world of media as the creator and hostess of Moments with Mo, earning the accolade of Africa's first lady of chat. The show was the first of its kind to be syndicated across Africa with an impressive guest list that includes Hillary Clinton, President Muhammadu Buhari, Christine Lagarde, amongst many others. Three years ago, she launched Ebony Live TV, which is Africa's first global black entertainment and lifestyle network. In 2014, she started Ebony Live Films, her debut film, 50, and her second film, The Wedding Party, were both premiered at prestigious international film festivals and have broken box office records. <laughs> Mo is highly sought after for her in-depth knowledge on the African and global creative industries. She's spoken at many leading universities across the world, including Harvard University and University of Cambridge George Business School. She's received international recognition by Forbes as the first African woman to launch a Pan-Africa TV channel. She's also been recognized by CNN as Africa's queen of media who conquered the continent. Please join me. Conquered. Join me in giving a rousing Wimby's welcome to our guest speaker, 
Mo Abudu as she comes up to deliver the 2017 Wimby's Annual Lecture. What an introduction. Wow. I can't believe that I've really done those things. Thank you, Aisha. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Nervous as hell, by the way. Um, I think if you fear speaking in public, the most important thing is to face the fear and just say, I'm going to hell with the fear. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me. I felt so welcomed this morning when I came in and everybody was hugging me and saying, Mo, don't worry, you're going to be fine. So that, could, that kind of made me feel a bit more comfortable. Um, I called my mom before I came. I said, Mommy, I do I'm going to speak to some ladies, this women. And my mom, of course, she sort of went on and on for at least, I, I couldn't even get her off the phone, literally. Mommy, I have to go now. I think it's important to say a big thank you to the founding mothers that created Wimbys. Not the founding, there's one founding father amongst them, but the founding mothers. Often we say the founding fathers of things, but this institution, it has become that, has been founded by these amazing women. Thank you so much for giving us this platform. Now, I'm not an orator, I'm just going to speak as well as I can. Some people are very good at speaking, but I find I'm probably better at just getting on and doing it. Some of my um, members of my team are here with me and they always say I'm always micromanaging because it's like, just get it done anyway. Although they're great to work with. Um, I don't want to stand here and give a lecture today because who am I to give anyone a lecture about anything? Um, all I can say is that I thank God all the time for his favor and for the opportunities that I have been given. But so many of us work so hard so many times, and sometimes the results take time in yielding, but I don't think that's any reason for any of us to give up. We just have to keep going and to keep working hard. So I'm not perfect, believe me, I'm far from it. But what I would like to do today is to share a few of my ideas um, and a few tips on the things that I have done that have possibly worked. And I've done a lot of things that have not worked, by the way. Um, all our journeys are very different, so what works for me may not necessarily work for you. But all I can do is share. Now my resume at a glance, I turned 53 years old this year. I'm the mother of, the mother of two incredible children. I thank God I have a daughter and a son. He's, my son is actually turning 20, turned 21 today. <laughs> I'm a typical, what you call, serial entrepreneur. You know, they have serial murders and serial types of things. I cannot think of any other way to describe myself. I came back to Nigeria in 1992. Prior to that, I had a work record in the UK running a recruitment consultancy firm. I came back 25 years ago. I worked at ExxonMobil for nearly a decade. In between working for ExxonMobil, I decided that that was not enough. A good friend of mine and I, Yutinde Island, decided we wanted to open a store on our lower road called Body Shop. We had this big dream about you know, becoming the next body shop in Nigeria. The shop was actually called Body Talk. We'd made no money from that venture. Eventually, we had to shut it down. And then a few years, while still being at ExxonMobil, had another you know, brainwave about something called the Shopper's Checkbook, which was a bunch of checks that would give you discounts in a number of shops that you went to in Nigeria. So I went all over town collecting all these discounts, and I got Academy Press to print the massive stub of books which actually failed woefully. I ended up owing Academy Press a fortune that I had to pay off through my salary for many months thereafter. I then set up Vic Lawrence and Associates. But setting up Vic Lawrence and Associates, I had to take the bold step of leaving paid employment. I had a great job at ExxonMobil. There was really no reason in the world for me to have left that job. But I just felt, you know sometimes there's this yearning in you. There's something in you that just says you have to do more there is something more that you've been designed to do. There must be another purpose for your life that God has said that you must go out there and do. And it was really scary. I mean, this was a fantastic job. I mean, people that work in oil and gas don't leave, you stay. The other day, um, the MD's 
PA who I'd worked with for many years, turned 60, she was retiring. And I went for her send-off event at Exxon. And um, it was incredible just to see how much progression have, you know, people have advanced. Some of them have become EDs and directors and things like that. And I kept thinking, wow, if I had stayed, what would have happened? But the thing is, we all have to decide on the journeys we want to take in our lives. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. So at this particular point of time, leaving was a pretty big deal to me. And I don't know why, I guess when you take a risk, you just take the risk to help with whatever the consequences are. So at the time, I gave plenty of notice, I left, and I set up the Clements and Associates. And I think at times it's about identifying the opportunities that you see in the marketplace. I just felt there was a need for what I was able to do externally. And at the time, there weren't that many you know, HR and consulting firms in Nigeria. Our biggest competitor at the time was probably Philips Consulting. Um, FOP and I have since become very good friends, but in those days, we were sort of like competing um, with one another to get all the various jobs from oil and gas and banking and the telcos had newly come into Nigeria at the time, so we were all out there just trying to get those briefs. And Ebony Life, um, I could say, Vic Lawrence was working very, very well. But as Vic Lawrence was working very, very well, it occurred to me at this point that we were running all these training courses. Then I used to use a resort called TCC Ogiri, which is outside of Lagos. Um, would drive down there, would sometimes use the Eco Hotel, would sometimes use um, the Sheraton Hotel. But there was so much noise, and, and you know, of course, events were, would be happening at these places. And it occurred to me that why not set up a purpose-built training and conference facility that's actually purpose-built for this, for this. So I started thinking about it. You know, how do you go about sort of even trying to get the land and then sort of getting the design done and all of that? And I was 35 at the time, and th the most important thing I could do then was to try and find the land. And you know, as an entrepreneur, you're very sort of like, to hell with it. You don't even care how much the project is going to cost. So of course, I went ahead and decided I was going to buy the land. And eventually, I found a piece of land. I didn't have enough money to finish paying for the land. I went to a good friend of mine at the time, Shubu Giwamu, who was then the manager of Ecobank on Awoloa Road. I didn't have enough money. I said, Shubu, I need you to give me an extra XYZ amount of money. And Shubu, within 24 hours, was able to just work miracles. And I got the balance of that money, paid for the land. The land was now paid for. The next thing was, OK, a very good friend of mine, Tayo Babalaki, I said, I don't have money. You have to help me design. Tayo did the design and then promptly says, this is um, going to cost you like six, seven million dollars. I was like, OK, fine, no problem at all. Six, seven million dollars, we'll find it. And then one day, I'm at an event. Dick Kramer is at this event. And Dick says to me, no, you can't just build a center. It must be branded. Let me introduce you to the Protea Hotel Group. And I go off to meet Dick. Dick introduces me to the Protea Hotel Group. And back and forth, eventually, they're on board. And then the project's now going to cost $10 million. I'm like, oh, wow, OK. What do we do now? So I was at an event again, which is why it's very important to go out and network. You can't just be in your house wanting to make a dream come true. So um, at this point in time, I was at another event, and I met Femi Lijadu, who was then at UBA. And I said, Femi, you know, please, I really need help. I need to raise this money. And Femi said, OK, go and see Tony Fido, who was then head of corporate finance. So I think you know how sometimes someone is just saying something to you in passing. So it's always important to listen. It doesn't matter if they've actually said, go and see the person, or the person's name was mentioned. Femi just probably actually mentioned it quite casually. And I went along, and I looked. I didn't know who Tony Fido was. I went, looked for Tony Fido. And I had a meeting with him, and for whatever reason, he decided that he was going to take a massive interest in that project. And he actually helped me put together the info memo that I needed to go out there and raise money, to raise $10 million. I'm like, okay, well, here we go. And that's basically how the journey started. I reached out to UBA trustees. At the time, Nigel Lardner was at UBA trustees. He bought into the project. I reached out to Sholadi Ayo. He bought into the project, Leadway Assurance. And within a matter of probably about 12 to 18 months, the money was finally raised for this project. And then we went to town, and it took about three years to actually get the place built. And that's how the Protea Hotel Oakwood Park became a reality. So the Protea Hotel is working. I'm not really involved in the day-to-day -day management of the Protea Hotel. I'm running Vic Lawrence, and everything is fine. And then I'm sleeping one particular night. And I think it's important at times to, I go to bed with a notepad by my bed. I have a notepad, and I have a pen every night. And this particular night, I cannot say it is nothing but God speaking to me. And we all have to def you know, define how God speaks to us. 
but I just found that I was able to pick up my notepad, pick up my pen, and I was just literally just writing reels and reels of the birth of Inspire Africa. Even the name Inspire Africa, even the concept for Moments with Mo just came like that. And I was writing and writing. And thank God I had a consultancy background. The very next thing I did was to put together a presentation. And I now went out and I said to myself, I need to sell this. Because it doesn't matter what we're doing in this life. We are selling something. It doesn't matter what it is. You're either selling yourself, a product, a service, a business, whatever it is. We all have to understand that it's important to be able to sell. Put together this wonderful presentation, went out there, did a lot of marketing, and trying to get you know, interest in Moments with Mo. Some couldn't understand the vision. And it's important that at times that you may have a vision, others may not see that vision, because they're not you. So you have a responsibility to share that vision as best as you can with others and paint a picture as wide as you can so they can obviously buy into the vision. And not everybody is going to buy into your vision. I often say in life, you're going to meet your dream makers and you're going to meet your dream killers. And it's important, just as important to listen to the dream killers as it is to listen to the dream makers. Because the dream killers are going to raise all kinds of objections that at times I go back, based on what a dream killer has said, I've gone home and I've thought, ah, by the way, oh dream killer, you've actually helped me realize a very good point that I wasn't thinking about before. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to do more research into that particular topic so I have a more robust presentation. And your dream makers are the complete strangers that you meet. For me personally, that I've never known them. They've walked into my life at various points in time and they've been there to help you birth a dream. Now some of you may have also experienced that, that when you look at your success, it may not be based on the people you know. It could be often based on people that you don't actually know. And when you're talking about it years and years later, yes, you've come to know them, they've now become a major part of your life, but that's been pretty much my story. I did this beautiful presentation, went to a particular bank, the bank bought into it and said, yes, we're on board. And then at some point they hired a head of corporate. The head of corporate was a dream killer and just said, I'm not buying this idea. I was devastated because literally they had signed. And I called a very good friend of mine called Mac Atassi. I said, Mac, I need to raise money for these moments with Mo. How are we going to do it? So he said, how much? I said, about 250 million naira at the time. He says, Mo, that's a lot of money for one year. Why don't you break this thing down? Why don't you find enough money to launch a season of moments with Mo? And based on the success of that, you can then launch subsequent seasons. And I thought, okay, I, I, I didn't, I'd rather well, I ha wish I had the money in the bank for the whole year to be comfortable, but that wasn't going to happen. God always puts some of us under pressure. And I've found that I'm one person he always puts under pressure. Things are never, ever easy. Never. You always have to kind of like, he will always be there though, at the point of when you think something isn't about to happen, but he's always putting me under pressure. And at times I'm like, God, can't you just let this thing just happen and let me just let everything be honky-dory? But no, it's never honky-dory. We always are challenged. We're always working hard to see how, and I think he does it because he just wants us to get better. He never wants us to get into a comfort zone where you can just sit back and you can relax and everything is well. It is well, but we must keep working hard. So at this point in time, Max said, let's go and see Mr. Sholakin Femiwa. I'd never in my entire life met Mr. Femiwa. Went into a meeting with him, did a presentation. I didn't even know if he liked the presentation, if he hated the presentation. I left the meeting thinking, well, another one bites the dust. Only for him to turn around a few days later to say, we don't want to sponsor Moments with Mo. We want to invest in your company, Inspire Africa. Because at the time, there was an SME scheme that we could take advantage of. And that is basically how Moments with Mo was birthed. I didn't have a studio to shoot. I had to look for studio space. Eventually, across the street from here, the city mall, is where I eventually found. It was an empty space. We had to renovate the space and turn it into a studio. And that became the life of Moments with Mo. And then I said to myself, I need to find somebody very important to interview as my first interview. Who is this person going to be? I decided it was going to be Professor Wally Shoyinka. So I chased and chased and chased, and eventually he said yes. Um, we've become very good friends, even to the point that I've actually acquired the rights to his book, Death and the King's Horseman, which we're hoping to make into a feature film at some point very soon. So after Moments with Mo came the birth of two other shows. I hadn't launched Ebony Life TV at the time. So Moments with Mo was launched on the Mnet platform. And at the time, even going in to see Mnet, I remember very clearly having a discussion with Mnet about Moments with Mo. And they said to me, we don't need a show like Moments with Mo. We have the Oprah Winfrey show. 
we have the Ellen DeGeneres show. At the time, we have the Tara Banks show. We have all these incredible talk shows. And I said, these shows are great, but how local are they? How can I apply my local knowledge to these shows? How can you apply your local experience to these shows? If you're going through domestic abuse, and Oprah does an interview about domestic abuse, abuse are you going to go and call Dr. Phil in America to come and help you with your problem? No. We need someone locally here. And there are so many people that are doing great work in those areas that never had a platform through which they could engage, victims that have become victors, people that are doing great things in our society, the singers, the musicians, the fashion designers, the entrepreneurs. Moments with Mo just became a platform through which we could tell these incredible stories and also showcase some of the greatness and also some of the evils that are going on in our society so we can find a way to fight them and also to end them. So Moments with Mo was moving along very smoothly. But I decided that it was time to launch other content. I really enjoyed being in this space. You know when you somehow feel that God has created that space where you want to be? So we launched another show called The Debaters. I don't know if any of you here are familiar with it, but it was on TV for two years. It was sponsored by GT Bank during the days of Ms. Adini Roku. It was very, very well received. It was a program targeted at our youth, giving them a platform through which they could engage and have discussions about things that were important to them. I'm hoping that at some time in the future we can bring such a show back because I think it's important for our youth to continue to have a voice. And then after that, we launched another show called Niger Diamonds. And at times, it's important to find the brand association with what you're trying to sell. So I went along um, to Diamond Bank at the time, um, and I spoke to Uzama about this particular show, and I said, this show is called Niger Diamonds. Do you want another bank to buy it? I don't think so. Immediately, he said, no, we have to buy this show. We have to be a part of this show. And Aja Diamonds was basically a show that was celebrating on celebrated heroes in our midst. There were so many people in Nigeria doing great things. The stories are never heard. And Niger Diamonds was that show that actually did that. But that still wasn't enough. I decided that I needed to have a whole TV channel. So I called a friend of mine in South Africa. Her name is Sandra Amadio. And Sandra had been working with us as a producer because we wanted Moments with Mo to be Pan-African. So she would go off to different parts of Africa shooting. And I said, Sandra, I want to launch a TV channel. And Sandra's that kind of person. Even if I say I want to go to the moon, she'll say, sure, let's go. So I said, Sandra, I want to launch a channel. She goes, Mo, that's a really great idea. Great, you know, wonderful. But then started the work. He wants to launch a TV channel. And the thing is that once you kind of put these ideas out there, I'm the kind of person that once I say something, I kind of now am obliged to see it through. So I'm very careful now about the things that I see. Because if not, I won't sleep. So the moments, um, the Ebony Live TV dream started very much with me speaking to Joe Hunda. So Sandra said, sounds like a great idea. But Sandra wasn't going to do the initial work. I had to figure out how I was going to launch this platform. So I went along to Mnet again and I said, please, you have all these platforms on your platform, all these platforms on your, all these TV channels on your platform. I would like to launch a TV channel. You've got all these Africa Magic channels, you've got all these international channels, but you don't actually have a channel that's engaging this new generation of those aged 18 to 34. Something that shows the Africa of today. Because when we launched Ebony Life Television, our catchphrase at the time was, everything you think you know about Africa is about to change forever. Because if you Google Africa, the images that come up, it's not us sitting in this room or me standing here. The images are destruction, disaster, war, genocide, all the evils that you could possibly think of is what defines Africa. I remember a few years ago, during my moments with Mo Days, I stood on a street corner at Marble Arch, and it was one of the episodes called, you know, the image of Africa. And I was stopping people randomly in the street. When you hear the word Africa, what do you think? I heard famine, I heard Mugabe, I heard HIV. The nicest feedback I got was sunshine. <laughs> and somebody said safaris. So I said, why do you think this of Africa? And their response was, it's what we see on television, ain't it? So you can imagine the level of the person that is out there understanding the perceptions of Africa. They're not graduates, they're just ordinary people that turn on their television sets, every day, turn on their radios, read National Geographic, and believe that this is the true story of Africa. We have left the narrative of who we are for too long to everyone else to tell our stories. So I truly believe that God has laid it in my own heart 
to go out there and change this narrative. And that is what has fueled everything that I have continued to do in this space, even with the launch of Ebony Life Films. The first film we did was about four beautiful women that are all Nigerian. Yes, I can get on my knees right this second and greet my grandmother or, or whoever it is, but that doesn't mean I can't put on my six inch heels, wear this dress and be like every woman all over the world. So it's important for the world to understand that African women have come, we are global citizens of the world. We have joined that race and we must be recognized as such. Then came our next film, The Wedding Party, which was meant to show the vibrancy, the color, the beauty of how um, marriages and weddings happen in Nigeria, along with all the drama, of course. And, and that was the birth of Ebony Life Films. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm the mother of two. And more ideas are coming. I'm never going to stop the ideas from flowing. I just pray that God gives me the capacity to be able to do them. But what I've started to do now is that as the ideas come, if I can't, I can't execute them myself, I need to build a team that can execute. So never think that you're doing so much that you can't do anymore. What is important is to keep finding teams of people that can help you to achieve the dream and the vision that you have. Now today we're talking about times of uncertainty, you know, and I'm supposed to be talking about bold steps in the face of this uncertainty. Now two years ago, we were valued as the biggest economy on the continent. We had an oil economy, we were very dependent. Everybody was going to Abuja, getting contracts. Nobody had to do any work, whatever it was. Everybody was feeling very happy with themselves. And then the price of oil halved. We had a new government that came in. They've tried to peg the Naira to the dollar. This has failed woefully. This is the longest recession this country has had in 25 years. So I've been told. Then on the other hand, we have Brexit in the UK where they don't want us. We have Trumpism in America, where they don't want us. So what is left? <laughs> we have nothing left but this Nigeria. <laughs> so we either make it work or we go home. And I don't know where to go home to, because this is really home. This is where we are. But I think at times like this, it's important not to panic. It's important to stay calm. It's the time to really be as creative as we can, be as innovative as we can, and to think out of the box. We need to look within. But I think it's also important for us to look outside, even in that Brexit, even in that Trumpism country, USA, there are opportunities there. And if we can legally enter those countries to seek those opportunities, we must find ways to do so. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the success of the wedding party because it's made headline news in China. When somebody sent me a news clipping from China, I was like, okay. Um, Variety magazine is the biggest and the most successful show business magazine in America. We made headlines there about, you know, during, and the headlines are actually very particular, that during a recessionary time in Nigeria, a film like The Wedding Party has made, has broken all box office records. To date, it's made over 450 million naira. <laughs> now, we had hoped that this film would do well, but we were never sure how well it would do. Of course, we did all the things that we could do. And everybody has been asking me, Mo, what did you guys do? Why did you? So we had to, of course, there was a strategy to it. So we've documented the strategy. But it's really not just about documenting strategy. It's about executing the strategy. And, but I think one of the reasons why the wedding party has been successful at this time, which is why timing is very important, is because number one is escapism. Everybody wants to be happy. It's cheap fun to go to the cinema, 1,500 naira. It's a cheap date. So for the guys that are out there wanting to take a babe out, it's nice and cheap. One five, popcorn is another 1,000 naira. 5,000 naira, you've had a really good date. So <laughs> you want to take your mom out, you want to take your sister out. It's really a cheap form of, of having fun.